Yeah, well, good afternoon. Uh, we're happy to be here. And Yes, uh, both of us. <laughs> Go for it. And that's my friend, Dan Fauché. And uh, yeah, we, we recognize that uh, both of us have some lean background. And as, as kind of a disclaimer, uh, I'll comment that I've been involved in CII since uh, about 1990, been on many research teams. And, and though I've been also involved in the Lean Construction Institute, I have never worked on a hospital project. I have never worked <laughs> on a commercial project. So uh, uh, what today applies to in industrial work and it applies to large scale work. So Daniel, give a quick intro. Sure. I've been uh, in the construction design development game for about 46 years. Uh, count the wrinkles on my face and subtract by 46. There's some missing years there. Prison was hard. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I've been uh, a lean advocate and coach since 2008 uh, when I met Greg Howell and spent the next 19 months on an almost daily basis with him mm -hmm. uh, and uh, been going at it ever since. And I actually have worked on uh, on projects like this, but on the building side, uh, hospitals, universities and all that sort of thing, uh, as well as heavy and highway. So it's great. We're going to give you. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the same principles from very different perspectives. Yep. Dan talked about his. Mine is all industrial and manufacturing and, and power industry. So, but the the principles we're going to talk about are going to be consistent. And this is part of the uh, joint working group, and we've been lucky to have a lot of people involved, and we're we're generating a lot of interest. I think the best part I recognize is we bring up some of these lean ideas. Nobody seems to be arguing with us, and so uh, we're we're making. Some good progress, and we'll just keep going. Uh, this is the first in the set of series. You want to cover the rest of them, Dan? Uh, yeah, but we in in uh, September, uh, Fernando and I will be doing big rooms and interactive planning with AWP and Lean, uh, and then later in that month, site material management, uh, October 30th, uh, just before Halloween, contracting strategy and requirements, and November 27th. I think that's just after Thanksgiving. Uh, look ahead planning and production control. So oh, good series. So, uh, it is, it's great. And it's all part of the AWP plus lean initiative that a lot of you have been involved in or yeah. know about. So people here at TVD that started out as target value design. And now we're talking about target value delivery. And basically the difference is target value delivery is all encompassing and target value design relates to pre-construction. So Target value design is a part of target, target value delivery. We're probably going to spend a little more time today talking about target value design, um, but uh, certainly it's all a cohesive set of ideas and principles. And the topics we'll, we'll talk a bit about today are some common problems and frustrations, uh, introduce some key slides, some key, key concepts, and then Every time we do this, at least silently, someone is saying, yeah, but how do I know I'm getting the best price? And so I think we'll, we'll, we'll cover that briefly and we'll have a, uh, some uh, entertaining conversation about that. So well, answer it definitively, John. Well, the, 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 just the, kidding. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> so we, hey, Dan, do you agree that the, the industry creates some truly amazing oh. stuff? It's amazing what we do. I am I am continually amazed. The uh, ACE awards, the Opals were just this uh, past week, and uh, some amazing projects that uh, civil engineers and others uh, are creating. Uh, architects and engineers on the on the uh, building, uh, you know, vertical side, and everything that's happening in oil and gas and and data centers and manufacturing, truly impressive. Uh, but yeah. But we want we want to do some things better, and you know every project seems like there's three or four really big questions, and uh, the one is what is it we're going to build, and yep. then uh, can we build it for the money we got? Yep. When will we be able to use it? And then when can you give me reliable answers to those questions? And that's a lot about what we're going to talk about is is going through that uh, discussion. And so this this next conversation this really was a conversation I had. Uh, with a one of our senior structural managers, and we were basically in the break room or the coffee room, and and he was having a tough day. And he walks in, and Dan's going to help me by being our, our design manager. We're we're going to do a role play here for just a quick yeah. second. Forgive us. 
I'm overwhelmed. I can't get enough staff. I don't have enough time to effectively onboard the ones I can hire. Ah, no. ah, that, that sounds incredibly frustrating. And I can see that. I can see the stress in your face. And But just curious, does your staff sometimes spend a lot of time working on things that later change or get thrown away or discarded? Oh, my goodness. It happens every day. Yeah, that, that's that's what I thought. Yep. I wonder why we keep doing that. <laughs> we don't have a choice. It's our system. Huh. Hmm. Let's let's think about that. And so if our kind of our goal today is to get you into that uh, wondering uh, if there's a better way to go do things. So we're just trying to introduce some concepts to you and, and get that curiosity going in your minds. And we'll start with a slide I've used a few times. Most of this is new material, but this slide you might have seen a couple of times. But this talks about typical pre-construction flow. In most jobs, you start out, you hire an architect, engineer, do some preliminary design, you get some kind of preliminary estimate, see if that's gonna fit the budget. If it doesn't, maybe you go back and change it, but very often you've already mobilized the design team. Everyone's here, the date's not changing. And so we go right on in to detail design and get a bunch of contractor bids, exercise people pretty hard. Kind of the insidious thing about this is, uh, a lot of times the people doing the preliminary estimate aren't very involved in the design. The folks doing the design aren't very involved, don't understand that, what was in the estimate. And, and we keep listening to the owners throughout the design. And we keep making improvements. And so by the time we get the contractor bid, we're going to say, hey, does that fit the budget? And so this is after we spent all of the design effort. We, we get, yeah. get the answer to this question. And then if that's yes, you get a semi-reliable cost. And that's kind of really where the change control begins. But kind of the insidious thing is, well, what if it didn't? Now what are we going to go do? Because all the bidders were high. The job's not moving. Yeah. What's, what, what happens there, Dan? All the bidders were high. Yeah. That, 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 that sometimes happens, or they didn't understand the scope, or there was too much spread. There was something wrong here. And so then under extreme pressure you got to go through and redo the whole design in the short term rebid the whole thing usually the design team is being heavily chastised for being unable to design the budget and, and i've always wondered how were they supposed to know what the contractors were going to go bid and yeah. how well did the contractors really understand the scope so this is a, a, a tough situation and eventually construction might get started i think a lot of projects actually die here unnecessarily and it, it's sort of a train wreck and say, well, I presented this slide quite a few times. And usually I ask, hey, how often do you see this happening on projects? Is this something I'm just imagining? You know, how disruptive is this? Um, the, the, I noticed on the LCI website for target value delivery, they were coming up to 70%. That seems about right to me. Why do you think in your world, Dan? Yeah, I, I, that's pretty much the, the number that, that everybody has. Between 70, 75% are yeah. just train wrecks. Lots. And then what's really bad is, is, is these people were supposed to be off on some other project. We were supposed to be getting the project launched. You know, the, a lot of things were supposed and so lean is all about flow. I talk about flow all the time. Well, nothing is more disruptive than the smooth flow of the project than this. Yeah. And having a train wreck on, you know, before you even can mobilize the contractor. So there's some there's some waste that seem pretty obvious to me. And, you know, one is you've lost time for redesigning and rebidding. Uh, second, you prepare, spend a lot of money to prepare very highly detailed documents. You you put the dimensions for the anchor bolts on those drawings months before anyone's going to cast concrete. And again, you're, you're not so much using your pre-construction capacity or your engineering capacity very well. And so some other ones, Dan, you might think uh, would go through. Yeah, the, the, the opportunity cost of constructability is missing. I mean, uh, we we're missing the people who know what this is going how to how it's going to be built and and uh, what it's going to cost and and not how to build in design the how is not built into the because yeah. designers are not builders uh similarly viable cost savings ideas not considered almost every material supplier and trade contractor and epc have really great current ideas about what's currently available cost savings uh, you know, pre-assembly, uh, uh, all that sort of thing, not necessarily considered, uh, and the viable scope or, or the entire projects 
uh, have to be scrapped. Scrapped at, at yeah. some point. It's, I've, been on, only, I've been in that situation. It's it's not good. Not only could they tell you um, what's out there, they can tell you what they know how to build. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so constructability is in the eyes of the constructor. And yeah. so you you have to have the constructor in the room with you to make that work. And that's why the surrogates don't work out so well. And a few more things here is what I've seen is you, of course, the, the dangerous thing is you chase really bad projects way too long. And yeah. so uh, I think some projects just aren't meant to be. And as, as uh, I spent a lot of time with some really large engineering construction companies and we were doing an inventory of projects. And what we kind of recognize is the really bad projects were bad projects from day one. <laughs> the fundamental project concept wasn't valid. And so the we 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 chased it for a long time before we finally uh, understood that. And then very often the risk, uncertainties, assumptions aren't brought out until much later when they do much more damage. And of course, how about teamwork, Dan? What happens? What happens? Well, you know, John, team? you you you've been there. Uh, yeah. We try. This is a people business, right? Yeah. It's, it's people way more than transactions. And yeah. to try to build a culture. And and a teamwork with a, when this is going that badly uh, is if you did start it right, it's going to poison it, and it's going to be hard to re to re yeah, we overcome that. Like yeah. we those projects get built, we overcome this, but it, uh -huh. it doesn't seem to be so hard. So I think uh, we're going there. This this list of things we say that could go wrong sounds kind of like the side effects you hear about on the medication commercials on TV. <laughs> this is a wonderful new drug, but you know it may cause your head to fall. But yeah. uh, that's a side effect you have to live with. So going through here, so this is what we've been doing. And what I'm saying is to understand what it's going to go cost, this is a brutally expensive way to go do it and, and, and kind of disrespectful to the people. So as an alternate, uh, T target rate design looks something like this. Uh, this yep. is based on a collaborative design scoping process that I used at other companies. But you go select the engineer of the Arctic and an integrator. And an integrator is fundamentally different than a CEM. And that's a pretty important distinction. CEMs manage contracts. And in the lean world, one of the things we think one of the left turns industry made somewhere back in the 80s or 90s is thinking you can run the project by managing contracts. And I think that we're about to convince ourselves that that doesn't work so well. If you can, bring in the actual trade partners. The things we're going to talk about, you can still get some of the benefit if you don't, but it definitely works better. If you have them, that's when you start change control. <laughs> and then what we've learned is you don't need a design to understand what it's going to cost. You need to understand the scope and you can go negotiate it. And you actually still go through this cycle, some of it, but you go through it very rapidly. And you aren't having to redo your whole design. It's like it may be a conversation over the at the water tour where this where this where this can happen. And so the end of that is you end up doing you you get your cost, then you design it. So target. Right value, design, target, value, delivery, and and how this is often, how owners are convinced to try this often is they you cannot wait that long. And so this is a, always a faster way to, to get started and, and get to the end. You got any comments on this one, Dan? Well, it's 70% of costs, of the ultimate costs, are locked up in, in the schematic design portion of design. If there's schematic and then detail and then construction drawings, it's 70% it, happens up front in the choices we make without any input from many other people. Yeah, that's, that's so it's there. So, and this is a really important point. This is this is a new slide for those who have been seeing this before. When you compare the, the scope and the design of what happens in a collaborative way to what happens in the traditional world, you can't compare because the design solution will be completely different. When you've engaged in this process, you're gonna come up with a design that by its very nature and delivery is easier to build, easier to design, more complete, better understood, and you make the design decisions at the right time instead of forcing them way too early. I don't know how many times I've, I've seen the, the engineer give the owner an, an information needs list, which is like 60 pages long, and I need it by next week. Uh, I, I don't know if Dan, if that sounds familiar to you, but it is. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to make that, and I think what what the point would you make about that one, Dan? I, I I would say that you want to to ask for information and do work 
that releases other work. So timely release of information, timely questions are, are really much better than some 60 page list. But if you're asking for a transactional contract to lock someone up front, you have to make all of those decisions way, and that's one of the huge opportunity costs. Is yep. you're, you know, is you're doing that way earlier. And I think, and then everyone understand the biggest savings in this and the biggest risk reduction is that everybody understands the scope. They understand their scope, how it fits with everybody else, and they understand the risk and assumptions everybody else is figuring in, which makes it. And often we have discovered a lot of times we we really help the owner understand their project a lot better. I mean, usually we seriously overestimate how well we understand the scope before we go into it. That's another classic thing. So do you want to talk about this one? In fact, here's a couple of diagrams that kind of illustrate that. In traditional construction, uh, the, uh, the point at which everyone understands the project really well is as we're almost finished building it. Uh, and at the very early stages, when we were designing it, when the owner was signing off on it, when the contractors were bidding or the EPCs were bidding it, uh, they didn't, the contingency is huge yeah. because, because we don't really know what we don't really know. Yeah, On the be. next slide, if we front load all of that and everybody comes in early, yeah, it's a, you, you shift cost around a little bit, but you save so much because now the understanding is common amongst everyone, almost everyone, and by the time you're building it, you you may yeah. learn a little bit more, but you're pretty knowledgeable about it very early on. Yeah, I, I like Will's slide. What I would say is is that the level of understanding is not only much earlier, it's actually much higher. So yeah. you get a much higher yeah. and a much earlier, which takes risk yeah. out of it. So make that point here. Well, I, I mentioned that 70% of the costs are locked up in schematic design. What happens is in traditional construction, Schematic design, very little input uh, from the from the builders and the and the actual trade contractors and and uh, and suppliers. Design development time frame. Then you move into construction documents. The problem is at each of these stages, you end up having to do rework. The designer says, "I'm finished with this stage," and then somebody says, "No, wait, we got to go back. This isn't going to work. We need this, this, this." And now designers, where, when are you finished with the stage? And you keep looping back. And that's that rework, John, that you were yeah. talking about. And as a consequence, costing is a part of very large deliverables. Yeah. Now, go ahead. Well, there are, I'll, I'll, I'll finish. There are only a handful of moments to get it right, or, or it will create rework. And if you do this, you end up doing value engineering, which means taking value out of the project aka value demolition yeah value entry the other way that's code for you know annoying the owner you know and really <laughs> frustrating the owner you know because most value entry you're stripping value out and that yeah. won't do what he wants and yeah. after he's going with the plans or they I want that would be specific my pronouns so and, and this is a lot of this is actually we're going to talk about it in a minute or two about a batch size problem that we do these we just, yeah, it still makes sense to do this, but not in giant batches. And right. so we're going to see, we, we'll, we'll hear one of our friends. Uh, we'll see if this comes up here. Uh, this is working fine. Turn your, turn your video up a little bit, everybody, because it's a little wonky here. But Imagine you're on a road trip to Abilene with your family. You've been driving two and a half hours, and you're ready to grab a bite for lunch. So as soon as the thought, I'm hungry, pops into your head, you take the first available exit. Shoot. There's nothing here that your picky eaters want to eat. You get back on the highway and repeat this process again. I'm hungry. Decide to take the first exit available and see what's there. Options aren't great. Decide to go to the next exit. Options are even worse. Decide to wait until the bigger town, 45 minutes away, to stop for food. Drive 45 more miles as everyone gets progressively hungrier. <laughs> Finally, eat. But everyone is too frustrated to enjoy it. Isn't it amazing how often we commit to ideas before we have to? Now imagine instead when you think, I'm hungry, you ask your partner to look up your options in the upcoming few towns. You talk through the pros and cons of each as a family. Eliminate several options immediately based on personal preferences. You discuss remaining options and weigh pros and cons of each. You take a vote, decide on an option that's a few exits down, 
and plug the best selection into Google Maps. You enjoy your lunch without incident, you get back on the highway and you continue your journey. The second process feels smoother because it follows a logical process of elimination. That is set-based design. It's the process of considering multiple solutions to the same problem at the same time. So the process looks like this. In the beginning, we might have three skin options, two structural options, two HVAC options, and three sources of power. Each option has a cost. Some combinations of options are budget busters. Others offer significant savings over a 50-year life cycle, but are incompatible with some of the basic options like skin and structure. What is the right combination of solutions? In point-based design, we pick one of each and design to that. And we end up redesigning because it's too expensive or we fail to understand the owner's goals because they didn't understand their full range of choices. This is partially because any design is a complex adaptive system, meaning that a perfect design of any one piece does not mean that we've perfected the whole. In set-based design, to help us better focus on the whole, we lightly explore all options. We may find that two of three are starting to look like better solutions when combined with other sets, skin versus power savings, for, for example. So we let the third one die, and our precious human resources are no longer being used to further an unusable design. Because we are designing to a budget and to the owner's clear values and conditions of satisfaction, we are able to make wise choices step by step, offering the owner alternatives and options with their cost trade-offs. So set-based design is the winnowing of many ideas into some good ideas, into a few better ideas, into the best idea. The key is we keep an open mind and make decisions at the last responsible moment to give ourselves the greatest range of choices and optimize the whole. That's so Stan, Stan Chu's with Gensler, by the way, and he's he is probably the the nation's and maybe even the world's foremost expert in explaining set-based design. So, yeah, uh, how does this how does this work in target value delivery? Because set-based design is kind of a uh, hand-in-glove uh, technique with target value delivery. Uh, so, it, with your permission, John, I'll just kind of run through this very quickly. Uh, the yeah. team organization is relatively flat, but there is an executive group of, of all the major players, the owner, the designer, uh, the, the builder or EPC, or uh, maybe some major trades uh, or consultants if they're involved. That's the executive group. The core group are the people that work for the executives. And in most cases, we're talking about the management level. Uh, and, but for for this particular project, there are a series of cluster groups, or what uh, our buddy Will Lichtig calls, uh, um, well, I'll come up with them in a minute. I'll, uh, <laughs> we have a prompt for it. Um, innovation groups. And those are, uh, well, let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Yep, cluster groups. The cluster group is uh, breaks the project into manageable pieces. That's that small batching you're talking about, John. It focuses on a specific design system and how it affects the budget because budget is a, a condition of design, a cost of design. Uh, it has greater ability to quickly learn and prototype solutions. Sometimes these clusters go out and visit other sites or see what other people have been doing. Uh, there's great ability to uh, change throughout the life cycle of the project as final decisions are made. Uh, that's that set-based thing that Stan was talking about. Yeah, you know, a little bit here, the, the quick thing here is I'm sure some folks are saying, you guys got to be crazy. You know, we're all taught that we want to make the decisions as soon as we can, as fast as we can, walking down a bill change. And, well, there, there's kind of a, a problem. There's a side effect of that. Yeah. You ever, ever said or heard someone say, uh, geez, that would have been really good information about a day ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's what cluster groups are intended to flush out. Because a cluster group is made up of several different kinds of people. There are the subject matter experts for that cluster. There are the stakeholders who have a big stake in that. And then we include one professional amateur, someone who knows nothing about this particular topic, but who could come at it with fresh eyes and ask the questions that everybody else is too embarrassed to ask because they're supposed to be experts. 
So those who represent one company should be able to speak for them. And this cluster group, every one of them, must include an estimator who can provide continuous estimating. Now, it's not down to the penny, but it's good yeah. continuous it's estimating. Enough to make the decision on what choice you're going to go make. We don't need to know no. down to the penny. Right. Uh, this, right. Uh, that's an illusion anyway. Order uh, of magnitude. Yeah. yeah. What do cluster groups do is they, they're, they're there, but if they need more information, they go get it. They're, they, you know, they go out and find other groups or other yeah. experts that will help them with this. And so this is where a lot of the, the decisions are made to, to go through that. So that's that. There's that. The other point sometimes we make is this is a, how you would manage a network, a network yeah. management system, and a network information system. There is, I think, Dan said, there's still there are still hierarchies, there are still contract controls, things like that. But the mindset is around opening up many lines of communication where hierarchies distinctly yeah. restrict them. That's the whole point is to control them down to one decision maker. So that, that is, that's a different way to go do it. You want know, to talk about the core group a bit? Well, let's just uh, let's just thumb through it real quickly. Uh, the, they're they're a day to day group uh, with on the ground leadership, and one person from the cluster from the core group uh, it, it goes to each of the clusters. Their responsibility is to the overall outcome of the project, and they foster collaboration and decision making within the cluster groups. They also facilitate, and this is a cool part of TVD, they also facilitate integration events. And that's where on an occasional basis, maybe every every month or every three months, whatever the pace of the design is, we pull the right people together, including the owner and end user. Uh, and and we have an integration event where the clusters and the uh, the sets are are described and winnowed there. Decisions are made by the decision makers uh, in integration events. Yeah, and so this the leader the leaders vary. The leader of the cluster group can come from any any of the participants, you know, because it's who's a great facilitator and it actually gets passed yeah. around. That's kind of different between um, what I learned in my early days as a general contractor is, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I know I'm in charge, and <laughs> we have that uh, we have that function of, of maintaining control. That is a big difference. Is yeah. you're out there distributing ideas, distributing controls instead of trying to dominate and, uh, and control that way. Kind of a different way of doing things. And so um, again, we, with the same basic team organization goes through. And one, I think everyone out there saying, "Wait a minute, I've been on teams like this my whole career." The difference is is this these teams and, and I've been to these integration events and team building events and interactive planning events. The difference is that these go on. That's how we run the whole project. It's, it's not one event that we go do and then we're done. You know, we, this is this is how the job runs every day and it's kind of how we think about it. Well, so, and cluster groups can uh, can form and disband as they're needed. The yep. executive group, on the other hand are the, the major stakeholders, executives or senior leaders that keep the team focused on the owner's conditions of satisfaction, the project conditions. Of, you know, if we get these three, these three or 12 things, then we, we will have a successful project. Uh, they are the highest level of issue resolution if issues cannot be resolved at other levels. And they support the core group and the cluster groups. And they can commit the resources necessary to make it happen. Yeah, and that's basically these are also the guys who agree not to sue each other, but uh, that's part of, part of <laughs> who the otherwise so, would have to. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. good deal. So uh, we talked a little bit about the McClamey curve. The uh, McClamey, uh, the the architect McClamey developed a curve that looked at time versus um, cost, and he what, we, what he found, and we know this to be true in our hearts is that your ability to positively affect cost diminishes as the design progresses and certainly well into construction. And the cost of changes soars, especially once you get into construction. So in traditional design, the traditional design focus is right at the intersection of those two lines. In set-based design and target value delivery, we front load that and so we know more about the project much earlier 
and we get to work together in these groups we're talking about. Yeah, the other thing, I'll add a comment here. One of the really key dis distinctions is, uh, is TBD and, and the relational contracting means that changes aren't so expensive. The, the yeah. Much of the cost of change are the highly transactional cost of change of, of working those through rigid contracts. Yeah. And so you're trying to take a flexible scope and, and run it through the change of rigid contract, it's, it's expensive and it's yep. very time consuming. So that's one of the key advantages of uh, the TVD approach. It's early involvement. Uh, and I, I like that uh, note you had there about continually considering cost because every yeah. time you your house and someone asks you, what option do you want? How often do you say, well, how much does it cost? Right. right. Every time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because so you're the owner. That concept. <laughs> ba batch size is a big deal in, lean, in the lean world. Yeah. You want to talk about that more, Dan? And, well, TVD breaks up the design and its cost components into these clusters and smaller batch work. Uh, the design work is done on components by clusters. Uh, there's that precious phrase that I keep stumbling with, uh, uh, Will Lichtig's phrase that Bolt Construction uses, innovation teams. Yeah. Uh, and the design work is checked in on, on a regular basis with the integration events that we were describing. Those are fun, by the way. They could be an hour, or maybe two or three hours if there's a lot to integrate. Uh, and cluster groups can move savings around to other groups uh, who, who need it. Right. If we could save a little bit here, we could spend more on what the end yeah. user really wants over here. It takes away this defending your turf, yep. defending your scope. And that not, it's not only between the cluster groups, if you have a contracting strategy, also between the contract entities, money can move around to whoever can go do it. You know, so I've, I've started recognizing a long time ago that these bid packages are a massive batch size problem. Way yeah. too much information you were trying to lock down at one time. Uh, so it's very disruptive. And again, we said it forces countless decisions far earlier than they would otherwise need to be made. And so you're way more subject to change. And pe yep. People don't quit thinking of things the day you go to the issue for construction drawings. Yep. Good ideas keep coming up. And you don't want to resist those. <laughs> you, want, you, you want to manage them in a controlled way. So let's talk a little bit about some of the key definitions, Dan. I'll, I'll click. Well, through it. we'll we'll just we'll just look at what uh, what uh, allowable cost is. This is how much the owner has to spend on this project. Uh, and so very often when we start doing things, the cost actually exceeds it. Uh, the expected cost. Uh, maybe something that the team early on says, if we just did this on the street, it actually is going to cost you 23 million, not 20 million owner. Uh, but when you get to designing it, it may actually exceed that. So mm -hmm. keep keep moving with your recursion there. There you go. So the parties get together fairly early on and set a target cost. Here is what we want to aim for. We have these. Uh, we have the 20 million allowable. But let's do it for 18.4. And everybody says, yeah, let's do it for 18.4. So first blush cost 27. Oh my God, we're ruined. But as we keep using target value delivery and set based design, we get down to the target cost and maybe even below it, which may be a good thing because once we start construction, there may be some additional costs that we hadn't anticipated. But if we're really rigorous at this, we can keep it to our target cost. A big point here, this, this is a big value thing for owners, you know, is that a lot of times when this money is coming out, it's not, we're not taking scope out of the job. We're not taking, we're not taking the capacity of the project out of the job. Much of the time we're removing contingency buffer and fear. Right. Okay. So when you force someone to give you a number up early, hey, so Dan, let me tell you, I ask you here, if, if, if I force you to give me a number early, but you under <laughs> lots of pressure, are you likely to include more contingency or less contingency? It's going to be a big number, John. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I don't really know what it's going to take. Now, we'll, we'll talk about that in can you get it cheaper when we understand, you know, if you're in a um, seller's market, that may not be such a good idea yeah. uh, as you go through that. But that's uh, but that's why you have change orders in that market, too. <laughs> so and this is a much great. better much better option than a bunch of change orders. Yeah, and, and by change orders are very frustrating for everybody, including, you know, that we go do it. So a few things about this. Uh, we're kind of we're, we're kind of cruising here towards the wrap up of this. And one is that this T, TVD, CDS process, they are team sports. They're not poker games. And one of the things I recognized real early on about the folks who kept showing up 
at the lean events and things of that nature. They weren't the guys who were trying to go out and negotiate you and trying to win with their buyout strategy. They were the GOAT guys trying to figure out how to go build at least, at least expensively way and make it easier. We're gonna talk about easier a couple more times before we're done. And a big deal is the owner is not above especially the owner and the general contractor or the program manager are not above the teams. They're part of the teams. They have literary responsibilities like everybody else. And it's really important, really important to have the folks who are actually going to run the plant in those conversations. So we understand what, what, what they need so they can help you find those conditions of satisfaction. And what about learning? You don't want them to suddenly start uh, show up during a commissioning and say, what, this is what you yeah. built for us. Uh, so yeah. they need to be involved right up front. Right. Yeah, and like I said, um, I use this basic approach on uh, very small projects, but also it, get, it goes to multi-billion dollar projects. Okay. So those, those values that Dan, Dan showed earlier, 23 million, you can add zeros. You, yeah. you can scale this to whatever you want to go do. It, 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 the, the concept works. And what I will say is the more complex your project is, the more you will value from what it is we're trying to cover here, because yeah. it deals with complexity of human things. And then... Ownership, transparency, and trust are essential. And for a lot of people, that's hard. I, mean, I remember we had a line at one CII team that I was on, trust is for suckers. And that is kind of a prevailing mindset. But we go to this, I'll quickly show you this slide from, uh, uh, I picked up from Edgar Schein, great author. He talks about what trust is, but hey, we're gonna acknowledge me, not take advantage of me. You wanna embarrass me or humiliate me, which I don't know how many times you've been in rooms where somebody very intentionally called someone out, undressed them in front of the room and felt very good about their ability to go do that. That's not the kind of behavior uh, we work here. So we're going to work on my behalf and support the goals. And so this is a trust-based system. And I, for me, I think life's going to be better if you work with people you can trust. Yeah. <laughs> you know, More so, fun too. Yeah. That makes, makes a lot simpler. So uh, this is uh, you know what this looks like. This is a CII uh, research report. You can see it's the RT341. It's been updated. This team has, has continued on. This slide is slightly out of date. But they went through and said, hey, what does industrial in, uh, integrated project delivery look like, which looks a lot like target value design, same ideas. But they had all these various collaborative things that they went through. And these are the types of things you would, the types of tools you could draw from. Um, Next generation AWP is now on the list as is project production management and operations science. So the next time we see this slide, it'll be updated. But one of the things I found really fascinating about the research, and it's consistent with my own experience, and maybe Dan's, is they plotted all these different projects. They had like, well, it looks like about 70 projects. And they looked at, hey, how collaborative were they? How many of those collaborative processes did they use? And then how did they turn out? And what they discovered was, hey, as you get a little ways down the path, you, know, you take the big losers out. So if you're a golfer, you're taking the double bogeys off the cover. And uh, that's, that's a really big deal for reducing risk for everybody. And I, I'd like, this is on the same slide deck as they did that same thing as they did a correlation between collaborative index and the performance of jobs and found a correlation coefficient of 0.95, which I, I don't remember all my statistics, but I think that's pretty good. That's pretty good, yeah. So a few typical experiences here, you know, um, I have found the owners tend to find this as a very positive experience, you know. Uh, they like it, one, is they understand the scope a lot better, they understand the assumptions a lot better, and they're much less likely to have to go back to their board of directors for more money. Yeah. And I've, I don't think I've ever worked for an owner who didn't tell me that was a very important thing. And also, we, we find these gaps early enough uh, to do something about them. And then it's great to have a delivery team that's out there focusing on solving your problems. As, as I figured out uh, fairly early in my career, I needed the supply chain out there helping me mitigate my problems, not exploit them. And so uh, uh, that just makes sense to me. You got comments on that one, Dan? No, but I, I'd love to see what contractors think. Well. The remarkable thing is, as, as I've been through this um, many times, as we get to the end of these collaborative scoping sessions, I'll ask, how confident are you in your number? In fact, we actually, our, our, our database system actually quantifies all that. But invariably, the contractor teams say, 
I am much more confident in this number than I would be if you sent me a bunch of bid documents. I know exactly what I am giving you scope for. And it's actually much less overall effort. And even in the sessions where we're not talking about their scope, they want to sit there and hear it. That's what's kind of surprised me is uh, there hasn't been resistance to that. And then, hey, why don't you talk a little bit about the uh, design perspective there? Well, creating innovative solutions is way more fun than preparing bid documents. And, and Stan Chu waxes on about this when he talks about uh, set-based design is that you can be much more creative and you're using higher levels of thought than uh, than if you're trying to just put uh, put everything in a BIM and crank it out. Uh, yeah. it, it's working with the construction team is great because they know stuff you don't know and you know stuff that they don't know. Uh, it's hard to arrange for common participation, but it's less overall effort. Design yeah. is done more quickly and you get more design, not less design, and even though it's happening in a shorter period of time. And so if you run a design company, that means you're the same number of people can work yeah. on more projects. That's a throughput yeah. issue. And Which they're design, doing anyway. <laughs> we do more projects with the same number of people. I believe that has some connection to our profitability. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. that'll be next that'll be the next workshop. But and the ability to go home to your family, by the yeah. way, for all yeah. of those people. Yeah, and uh, well, so here, yeah, we're talking about, we we're clearly advocating some form of early selection so that the contracting team is participating in and fully, and it's shaping the design decision, not just aware of them, not just offering constructability, they're actually helping shape it, they're part of the team. And so uh, I think, for 25 years, I've been uh, fielding this question. Yeah, but how do I know I'm getting the best price? Well, the first thing I'd say is, how can you possibly think you're getting the best price out of the system we described earlier? With that amount of rework, someone is paying for that. Someone that is this illusion of the free estimate. It's not free. Okay, someone is, that's built into everyone's rates. It's built into everyone's markups, it's there. And so the other big thing is the competition collaboration are not mutually exclusive. You can make the selection process here very uh, competitive. I'll explain a little bit why in one more slide. And then pretty basic, making sure that the supply chain doesn't make money is not the way you get to the best price. And a lot of our strategy, I mean, may, maybe I'm cynical, but that's what I'm seeing is the underlying mindset of quite a few. You have anything you want to add to that, Dan? No, I think you said it right. Yeah, pretty much. So, so Okay, guys, here. So a little bit, one of the reasons it's competitive is market leverage is great. I'm not asking you to give it up. In fact, I want you to enhance it. But competition makes us all better. Yeah. And then, but it only affects the things over which you have discretion. So if you're sitting in a pre-bid meeting and you're a contractor, I'm setting quite a few of those, the things you're talking about, your overhead and profit percentages and your contingency, and you're talking about, you know, what, what kind of a crew mix are you going to put on that? What kind of productivity factors? Well, that's what shapes the cost. And if I know those things, I know who's going to come in cheaper when the scope comes out. And so I can just ask you that. I don't have yeah. to have you go through a bit of whole bunch of joy and add a lot of risk. I can just ask you those questions and you can respond to that quickly. So those are the only things you have discretion over. And you can answer those questions rapidly. And then it's great for the owner in the selection process to be looking at the team who's trying to help him and then understand what they're going to charge him. You know, so you can see who's out there trying to help you with your project. Another big thing is, you know, this is very attractive to contractors because one, they don't waste a lot of time. They reduce their risk. It's a much better experience for their employees. And so it's more attractive. So uh, more, the more, more attractive projects probably generate the most competition for them. So I think that's, you can get through there. And then don't forget, market leverage works both ways. You know, the fundamental strategy of, our, of a lot of bidding systems relies upon a buyer's market. I, yeah. I don't know, I've, I've been reading the paper lately that may not be a buyer's market. You know, so it's kind of like knowing when to go through and do this. And, and, and don't forget that if you use all the leverage you can in a poker game to drive that first cost down. <laughs> Don't be surprised when the cards are reshuffled. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they respond the same way. I, any comment on that? We're, we're just about no, done. You're, you're, you're nailing it, man. So again, what? Okay. I We understand that, you guys, but I just can't. I just can't go do it or have to some way. Well, 
the way I think about that is driving projects a lot of like driving over an icy mountain road several times. And we're kind of used to doing that in a two wheel drive car with our all seasons tires. And sure enough, we make it. You know, most, a lot of time we actually get over the pass and we make it, but it's pretty risky. We'd much rather be in an SUV with, out with winter tires. But even if you can't change your contracting strategy and your whole format, you can probably buy winter tires. <laughs> so adopting, you, know, the, you, you can do that. So a lot of what we're talking about doesn't require you to, to change your contracting strategy. There are many ways to use IFOA is a great way, but there are many ways that don't. IFOA is the integrated form of agreement or multi-party agreement. There are lots of ways or numerous ways to get this involvement um, that don't rely on that. So whatever you're delivering, making sure that everybody really understands what's really going on about what's really important helps every project. And so this is a communication and a leadership issue. And I think it'll be easier. This is a, a great quote from uh, Shingo, copied often, but the whole purpose of improvement is to go easier, better, faster, cheaper in that order. And so I'm not saying, I never said this is gonna be easy, but I bet it's gonna be easier, a lot less frustrating. And I think if we, start go make it easier then the better faster and cheaper are much more likely to follow along behind so with that we got some resources here you can look at this the there's a lot of stuff from uh, lci uh, this is a particularly good uh, document here for integrated project yep. delivery i've got a website my friend fernando can chip in here uh good job. hi fernando yeah so I'd, uh, group, thought I'd jump in and, and start uh, a few questions, but please finish. That's awesome. Takeaways and questions. Perfect time. You're up, baby. Hey, great, great uh, conversation um, and discussion on target value delivery. Uh, clearly, we're going to have to dig in a little bit deeper on this huge opportunity, I believe, in, in the ADP and lean and, and project production management circles. But we do have some questions, uh, and I'm going to uh, kind of uh, walk through them. Uh, so um, I'm going to start with one. Um, how long? And this probably goes to to, to Dan uh, and and the the target value delivery uh, estimate process you, yeah. you described. Uh, how long could it take to get from the first estimate to the target cost? Ooh, uh, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, if your team has, let's do it in percentages of of the design time. Uh, it very often the, you shoot to do it within maybe what thirty percent of of design. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, I'm not doing the three stages thing. I'm just doing the percentage of the time that passes in design, uh, at least by 30%. Some people do it earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely by the time you start building, but you you should be able to do that way earlier so that the, the design build team that's front loaded has a, a target to shoot for and, and has a sense of when they're going to get there. Yeah, the, the, the CDS process I, I use, which is a little different than what I think Dan's using in the hospital business, but that's more of a sprint. And there, yeah. so for what would now be, a, say, a $200 million glass fiber plant, we went from explaining this, this presentation, basically, to the owner to being through the CDS and having the target cost in about four and a half months. Yeah. We, hadn't, we hadn't talked to one contractor <laughs> at that point, but in four and a half months, we, it, 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 it can be, that's an advantage is it's, and the extreme of this was when Bill Seed was, was with UHS, which is a hospital and healthcare company. Uh, and I believe it was for the Temecula Hospital, uh, which is kind of a notable project for that group. Mm -hmm. um, he challenged that the current cost per bed in California was a million plus per bed because of all the earthquake regs and all that stuff. He challenged them to come in with $790,000 per bed which is a significant difference and very challenging giving the way hospitals are, are, are approved in California. And they did it. So he, but that was day one. He did that day one <laughs> and everyone, oh, 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 uh, but they did it. So, similar, yeah. Very similar experiences in the industrial world. Go ahead, uh, Fernando. All right, yeah, so, um, Another question is, uh, what do you recommend is the best path to get this approach in front of open-minded owners? Uh, here's here's a, a thing I do with almost any group I go into. I ask them what's working and what's not working. 
and let them tell you what's not working. And that opens yeah. the, the door to talking about how that we could be better. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's got to be their idea that the not if you tell them what's not working, they're going to go, well, but this and this and this. Just ask those two open questions and write down what they say on a, you know, on a flip chart and then zero in on how do we make this better? Well, the, the, the close parallel is what are your three biggest frustrations? Uh, and, and you get that from a group of people and what's worked well is, hey, you, you put your frustrations on post of those, look at them. We go through a short summary like this and I ask, okay, move your, uh, well, the, take the post of those and put them in two columns, better or worse. And most of the time, you know, it, it becomes pretty self-evident. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Earlier, you showed a diagram in, in a lot of time savings, but in terms of time alone, how much faster is CDS versus traditional design build projects? Wow, uh, you got you got stats on that, John. I'm I know, trying. To... Yeah, I know. I know that we complete the we're through the CDS process in about the same amount of time that you do uh, your preliminary design. You know, so we we do have to have preliminary design to make a good CDS. We still have to know the capacities and the sizes and come up with PDF, uh, but it is. Uh, that that launching is faster. What's odd is some of the design may go on a lot longer because you're not trying to force the decisions early, but it's with a much different type of effort. So you're, if you think of design as the orchestrating the series of decisions that the owner has to make and guiding the team through the decisions, then you're making those key decisions better. And also you're recognizing which decisions shouldn't be made now. The, 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 about the, last possible moment. the challenge in coming up with the, I'm going to give you a number in a minute, <laughs> I promise. But the challenge in coming up with a number is that most of these projects are one off. And so what do you compare it to? Uh, but uh, I, I, one particular client of ours, uh, which is a vertical builder, and this was a multifamily apartments, our very large multifamily apartment complexes. Uh, and they had two nearly identical projects in design. And when they used this and last planner system in design, if they used those methodologies, the design finished 30 some percent faster than the one that didn't. Now, your mileage may vary and those there may have been other variables to account for. But the 30 percent is about what I is the closest I can come. There was yeah. actually a great case study. Uh, Dave, uh, he was with uh, Baker, one of my friends, Dave. He's, he was with oh, yeah. Uh, and, and he actually, his, he got his career launched when I asked him to come explain this story to our Portland community ch chapter. But they had two identical projects in Alabama. The first, they did the traditional way. And partway through that, we need another one. There was no one else to go do it. So they went and got people with no heavy industrial background at all and put them together. And they actually finished the second project early. And that was because what we call that concrete, concrete yeah. evidence that this is a faster way to do work. No. Yeah. All right, got so many good questions here. Um, another one, how early is too early to get a contractor involved or at least the contracting knowledge, I think? No such yeah. thing. No such thing. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it, what I would say is the contractors don't want to help you decide what you're going to go build. They don't well, want okay. to help you decide how big your process plan ought to be. But once you've decided that, Okay, so very early on, when you know what you're going to go build, that how many tons per day you're trying to produce, or that's about the right. Uh, you're, you do want to have some basic fundamental a, a layout concept, and you want to have the, the quantities of what you're trying to produce uh, figured out. And then, uh, like, uh, but it's almost true. They would almost they're they're not going to put much work into it, but they 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 don't want they want to have you decide how to build it a little bit more than what to build. I am in my answer to what John said. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Um, does this approach work with a design bid build project delivery method or just on a collaborative approach? Doesn't work I, very I well. I don't know how you make it, John. I don't know how you make it work in design bid build. It's great, man. You know, I've been on projects. I would say that one of the most successful implementations of this I had had the worst contract terms I've ever seen. Really? But while we got that, we got everyone to ignore them. Oh, <laughs> okay. And, and well. so, uh, we, it's, it's more of a of a leadership issue yeah. uh, than a uh, contracting issue. So the leadership is there on that. It's you know it's uh, sort of like 
you know, dancing in a ski suit. You know, it's just it's uh, you, there's just so much burden you would have there. It's just the the the, the contracting strategy makes it very hard and discourages people from having the orchestration together uh, to go do this. Yeah, yes, will party party. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, yes, uh, if you have good leadership, you can apply parts of this, but you're not going to deliver the benefits that you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, as soon as something goes wrong and somebody cool. points at the contract, you're in trouble. That, that was All my right, sure. example. There's, there's things yeah. you can go do. Yeah. Be, yeah. Okay. So how do you influence and educate the market where there's a lot of reluctance to move away from a from the comfort zone to adopt yeah. target value delivery and AWP? Well, with the with the group that the three of us belong to and the two of you lead, uh, what we're doing is is looking for case histories uh, and examples, even the, even small ones that would illustrate these kinds of things that work. Uh, and I think very often you have. I mean, if if the logic of it doesn't appeal to you, then let's let's show some demonstration cases. So yeah. that's kind of where we're headed with that. You know, I find it's not that hard, you know, to do this. I, I don't know how many times it's taken less than an hour. And so I told you about that example of having folks express their frustrations yeah. and will this be yeah. better or worse? Well, I've done that with a large group that happened to be uh, at a Jacobs office in Cincinnati. Uh, but invariably says, yeah, my boss won't get this or my owner won't get this. And I said, well, are you that much smarter than they are? Because you just got it in about an hour. <laughs> and by the way, yeah. we're, we're recording this meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, that was that was that was, that was uh, they're great friends, and they're, that was uh, I'm happy to have yeah. them. Uh, that, that's that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, and it is this integration that's really that's really happening. And even at the LCI Congress, we have yeah. some some oil and gas folks coming yeah. in and sharing some sh sharing some experiences in in uh, driving that's this ADP and lean. So I, I think I think we're on a great track to start exploring deeper into, into target value design. I know Great. that we've got another minute here. So, um, you know, uh, is uh, here's one. Does integrated project delivery promote the target value design? And what is the eventual opportunity to converge it with ADBP? I'll answer the first part of the question if John wants to answer the second. Yeah. Integrated project delivery was designed, was created to include target value delivery. Um, mm -hmm. So how about AWP, John? Well, it's how we package it. And it, the whole, the what, the main point I'm going to be making is of the concept is we need to start packaging the work by how we're going to build it, not by how we want to buy it. It's yeah. a building and composition problem, not a contracting or buyout problem. Nice. And so that's the other thing that we'll do is, is, is link up with the folks from operations and project production institute. So we're doing the work in the right size batches at the right time. I see countless people doing lots of great work way out of way before it needs to happen. And then it changes. So that's what, what the operations science I think will help us figure out is when how much how much work do we go once and, and how do we sequence it. Yeah. And I would also add to that that you know in, in the industrial space ADVP when we're we're talking about front end loading uh you know the different the different phases and 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 feed stage and and or a detailed engineering, there is tremendous opportunity to apply uh, this type of thinking as we go through any kind, most kinds of strategies that that make up our or break down our work breakdown structures. So yeah. I think this is a great opportunity, and I, I think we are um, at the top of the hour. So I will I will pause. There's a few more questions, and I'd like to get those uh, answered, and uh, we can send them out. So um, we'll Jenny, respond. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, with that, I will I will thank both of you for for uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, this is recorded. It will be released to all the uh, all those that uh, signed up. Indeed, right. we will post it on our uh, website within the next day or so, as soon as we get it edited. Great deal. Everyone, thank you again for your time. We look forward to seeing you at the next CII webinar. Dan, Fernanda, John, thank you again. See you later. All right. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Take care. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye, guys.